Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Exodus. We're picking it up in chapter 15 tonight. And tonight, we're really going to get down to it. I'm going to go ahead and say it right now. We're going to cover a lot of scriptures that people really need to hear for this time. We're going to read some verses in Isaiah and some verses in the Minor Prophets in the book of Amos. Some stuff that people really, really need to hear right now. In Exodus chapter 14, remember God divided the Red Sea, brought the children out of the captivity that they were into the Egyptians. And remember how we started the book of Exodus. We, we went and we read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where it speaks about how God divided the sea, brought them out. And it says that these things were in samples, meaning they were prophetic types for, for our warning upon whom the ends of the world shall come. So remember, this is prophecy preparing us for what's coming. Remember what God said in the last chapter. He said, fear not. And it said, the Lord will fight for you. And he truly does. I want to make one correction of something that I said that was wrong in the last study. For some reason, two different times I said, we went and we read in Isaiah 51, and I said that Rahab was um, symbolic of Israel. But of course, that's not true. It's symbolic of Egypt. So I had to make that correction. And remember, never take any man's word for what they say. Men can make mistakes. Men can lead you astray. But the word of God never will. So anything that anybody ever says, you check it out for yourself in the word of God. And that's how to get the truth sealed in your mind. We're going we're gonna to start our study today in Isaiah chapter 11 to see about what we're reading is prophecy. So we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 11. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So, all right, we're going to pick it up in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. What this is talking about is the second advent, the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which is, of course, future to us. And yes, we're back in the Old Testament. So don't ever forsake the Old Testament. Speaking of the return of Jesus Christ... Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, and it reads, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And you see, if you're serving God, judgment is rewards for you. That's what it's talking about when he says he... He will judge the poor, the, those who are maybe down on their luck. They got rewards coming. God gives rewards to those who serve Him, but He gives wrath to those who refuse to serve Him. Verse 5, And righteousness shall be the girdle of His loins, and faithfulness the girdle of His reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lay down with the, lo with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. That's how it is when Jesus Christ returns. We're all changed into spiritual bodies. And let's go ahead and read the next verse. Verse 7. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The animals will not be carnivores. They won't be eating each other. We can just all live together in, in harmony. But remember, well, let's just keep going. Verse 8. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. That, that's snakes. That's the vipers, the serpents. Now, remember, when Jesus Christ returns, the, the wicked are still here. But why does it say that the child can, can, can play with the snake and it's not going to be a problem? Well, you know that Satan is the serpent, as is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And when Jesus Christ returns, the 1,000-year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20 begins. Do you know where Satan's at during that 1,000 years? He's locked in the pit with no chance to deceive anybody, to sway anybody. And that 1,000-year teaching period is the final opportunity for anybody who has ever lived, if they did not overcome in the flesh, 
They have the opportunity to be taught without any type of sway from Satan. But then at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be released. And that's the final test. Do you want to serve Christ or do you want to serve Satan? Those who choose Satan will die the second death and their soul will perish. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Everybody's going to know who Jesus Christ is. Everybody's going to know his word and they will be able to see Christ. Literally, face to face, everyone will be able to see him. He will dwell with us. Verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for the ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Of course, that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came through the seed line of Jesse, through David, through the tribe of Judah, down to Jesus Christ being born. Verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day, the Lord's day, when Christ returns, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Well, what's the first time? That's what we're reading right now in the book of Exodus. But the second time, that's future. That's when the true Christ returns for the second advent. To recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Do you understand what that's saying? The twelve tribes are scattered all over the world. Like it even says in James chapter 1. So you see, many people, they think that, that those people that are over there in Jerusalem right now, they think that's where the twelve tribes are at. Well, those people would be wrong. As is made very clear right here, the 12 tribes are scattered. Yet yeah, some of the tribe of Judah is in Jerusalem right now, but many of them aren't, as we're about to read. Well, who, who are they that are in Jerusalem right now? They claim to be Jews, but like you read in Revelation chapter 2, 9 and 3, 9, they do lie and they are, they are of the synagogue of Satan. It's Satan's children right now that dwell in Jerusalem. That's their spot. They're called the Kenites in God's word, which means the offspring of Cain. And from a Kenite's very own mouth in Jeremiah 35, he says, we dwell at Jerusalem. They want you to think that they're Israel, but they're not. It's the false Jews that are over there. So you better know the difference. That's what even the key of David is in the book of Revelation. To know the difference between the true seed line and the false seed line which helps open up the entire Word of God if you know what happened in the Garden of Eden. And that helps you to know who the true Christ is from the false. You know the difference. Verse 13, or verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So once again, Judah is scattered as well. And so, I mean, 99% of the tribes of Israel, they don't know who they are. They let the Kenites rip their heritage away, and that's a tragedy. But when Jesus Christ returns, that they will know. And of course, you know that it really doesn't necessarily matter because salvation is for all people, whomsoever will. We're all of one family, those who believe on the Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. That's how it'll be when Christ returns. 14. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the, of the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and, and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. You know what it says in Revelation chapter 20 about verses 4 through 6? Those who stand against the false Christ... They will reign with Christ through that thousand year teaching period as priests. That's what you have to look forward to if you remain loyal to the true Christ. Verse 15, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river. That river is the river Euphrates. You might think about the sixth vial, Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. And shall smite it in seven streams. And make men go over dry shod. Verse 16, this is the whole reason we came here basically. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. 
like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. God's saying it's going to be the same when Christ returns as it was in Egypt. So now what we're reading in this book of Exodus is not just stories. This is prophecy teaching us through history exactly how the end is going to go down. So let's go to Exodus. We're going to go to chapter 15. Let's read it. Exodus chapter 15, verse, remember, God has just parted the Red Sea, brought the children of Israel on dry land, out of captivity. This is the, the song, there, there are basically two songs of Moses in the Word of God. You have one here, and you have one in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Here it will tell you that Moses and the children of Israel are singing this song. And in uh, Revelation chapter 15, verse 2 and 3, it speaks of those who overcome the false Christ. They will be singing the song of Moses. And that Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses, all basically centers around verse 31, where it says, Their rock is not as our rock. Their rock, the wicked ones, those who don't want to love God, their rock is the false Christ, Tyrus. But our rock is the true Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, you know, the false rock is the devil himself when he arrives as the false Messiah. So Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. When Pharaoh sent his chariots after the children of Israel, God brought the waters crashing down on them. He destroys the enemies of those who truly love God. And like it says in Psalm chapter 30, verse 11, Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off, my, off sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that, that thy glory may sing praise to thee. And so the, when we are having hard times, sometimes you might be really sad. You might be mourning. If you stay on the right path, God turns that sadness into gladness. Don't ever forget that. And remember Revelation chapter 9, verse 7, when it's speaking of that locust army, the fallen angels will come, who will come in the future. It says that, that, that they, they, um, their chariots, they look like horses. Their um, vehicle is like a horse. But that their faces as the faces of men, and they have crowns on their head like gold. And God will destroy the fallen angels. Revelation chapter 11, verse 13, when the seventh trumpet sounds and Jesus Christ returns, the 7,000 fallen angels, their soul, they die right there. Verse 2, The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. There is no other Savior but our Heavenly Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which are, of course, both one. He is my God, and I will prepare Him in habitation. The habitation is on, in our heart. The kingdom of God is within us. The Holy Spirit dwells within you if you love Him. You give Him that habitation. Get false doctrine and wickedness out of there. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. We don't exalt ourselves, we exalt our Heavenly Father. If you exalt yourself, you're going to be brought low. Verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. That in the Hebrew is Yahweh is His name. And He is a man of war. Once again, He destroys your enemies. And praise God for that. Verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his host had thee cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. That's why the last chapter said, Fear not. And it said, The Lord will fight for you. You don't have anything to worry about when God is on your side. Verse 7. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Like it says in Hebrews chapter 12, the last verse, God is a consuming fire. What happens when stubble hits the fire? I mean, it goes up in smoke. And that's exactly what will happen to the wicked who follow Satan at the end of the millennium. As is made clear to you in Psalm chapter 37 verse 20. And Satan's death sentence is given in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19. It says he'll be consumed by a fire from within. 
and he will go up into smoke. What's that mean? That means he no longer exists after that point. Verse 8. And with the blast, that's with the ruach, the spirit, of thy nostrils the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. You know what that flood is that's coming in the future. Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. The flood comes out of Satan's mouth. What does that mean? It means it's all lies. But then what's it say in verse 16? It says the earth swallows up that flood. I mean, if you have the seal of God in your forehead, then you aren't going to be deceived. That just means you have the truth sealed in your mind. And God will even use natural ways to destroy the enemy and to protect you. You know when the seventh vial is poured out right after the seventh trumpet sounds, 180 pound hailstones are going to come down. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 16, the weight of a talent. Verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. That's what the enemy thinks. The enemy thinks that you're an idiot for believing in Jesus Christ. The enemy thinks that you're stupid for studying the Bible. Well, just wait. Psalm chapter 2 says, why do the heathen rage? And you know what it says? The Lord will have them in derision. And notice how the enemy here keeps saying, I will do this, I will do that. I mean, the enemy is proud. And who is the enemy? Ultimately, it's Satan himself and those who follow him. But do you remember Exodus chapter 6? How in the first about eight verses or so, God said, I am going to do this, I will do that. He said, I, 18 times. But you see, the enemy, Satan, he wants to be God. And when he arrives as the false Christ, he will claim to be the God and Savior of all, like you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 11. Verse 10. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? There is no other God like our Heavenly Father. There's a lot of idols that people like to worship. There's a lot of rulers that want to raise themselves up as gods. But there is none like our Heavenly Father, the one who created heaven, who created earth. He created our very souls. And we will be praising Him for all eternity and saying, Who is like unto you? Continuing verse 11. Who is like thee, glorious in holiness? Fearful in praises, doing wonders. That last phrase, it means that God is to be revered in praising Him for His wondrous acts. And we do revere Him. Verse 12. Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Once again, and He swallows up, the earth swallows up that flood of lies to where you cannot be deceived if you have the truth sealed in your mind. Verse 13. And I wanted to mention also, remember in number chapter 16, when Korah, and who is Moses' cousin, him and some others, they tried to exalt themselves against Moses. They said, Moses, you're taking too much upon yourself. You remember what God did? God opened up the earth and swallowed them all whole, killed them right there. So you want to go against God's anointed? Big, big mistake. Verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. You know that we're redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. And God is so merciful because none of us deserve eternal life or salvation. But Jesus Christ came and he paid the price on that cross and resurrected for us. So we could have eternal life to those who believe on him. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. And of course, the holy habitation ultimately is, is the eternity to dwell with God. Verse 14. The people shall hear and be afraid. They say the wicked will. When Christ returns, those who were worshiping the false Christ, they're sure going to be afraid when they realize they've been deceived. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Palestine, that's talking about the place of the Philistines. That Hebrew word is used exactly eight times, and one of those places is Isaiah chapter 14, where it speaks of, O Lucifer, how art thou fallen? Verse 15. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. 
in the last chapters of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 49, you can read about the wrath that's going to come down on Edom. And in chapter 48, you can read the wrath that's going to come down on Moab. But of course, only to those who are not worshiping Jesus Christ. Because no matter what people you are, if you believe on Jesus Christ, like I said, we're all one family. And God's wrath has no effect on you. But those that want to go the way of the heathen, God's wrath is going to come down. And that last part, how it says, the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt. Do you remember what it says in Zechariah chapter 14, which also speaks of the return of our Savior Jesus Christ? It says in verse 12, how the plague will come where their eyes will melt in their sockets and their tongues will melt away. Well, what's that talking about? That's talking about when everybody's changed into a spiritual body. But those who were deceived by the false one, they're still changed into a spiritual body, but their soul remains mortal. That means it's still possible for them to be, for their soul to die. And they got to remain mortal through that thousand years. Don't let that happen to you. Verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. I mean, just shaken in fear when the true Messiah returns. Oh, you don't have anything to fear. It's rewards coming to you. But those who were deceived, they will just be stuck at the majesty and the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ returning. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased, who thou hast redeemed. What we just read about in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 16. I mean, the wicked, they're going to be just stuck, and every knee will bow. But God will bring those who serve Him from all over the world, they will bring them to that Mount Zion. Well, you will be rewarded. And like it says, I think it's Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 19. It says, God will get you praise and fame in all the places where you were mocked and you were hated. Verse 17. And of course, you know, Passover, you know, Jesus Christ is our Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. That's the time that the time that this took place was that Passover when God led him out of Egypt. Verse 17. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. That's, of course, Mount Zion. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. In the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. And you know from Revelation chapter 21 and 22, even after the millennium, it says that there is no temple because Almighty God and the Lamb are the temple thereof. And you're even a pillar of that temple if you remain loyal to Jesus Christ like you read in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Once again, what is the temple? It's the many-membered body of Christ. God does not dwell in a house made with hands. But the many-membered body of Christ, you, you are the temple. All those who believe on Jesus Christ. You want to know, read more about the sanctuary. Psalms chapter 73 through 89. That's the Leviticus book of the Psalms. Basically, the whole Psalms, all 150 chapters, it's basically split up into five sections. The Genesis book, the Exodus book, the Leviticus book, the Numbers book, and the Deuteronomy book. Well, the Leviticus book, Psalms chapter 70, or yeah, Psalms 73 through 89, that is the one that's about the sanctuary. Verse 18. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Like it says in Psalms chapter 20 verse 7, Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. And don't remember, it's God that brought them out of Egypt. It's God who protects us today. We don't put our trust in men, not in a preacher or anybody else. But you put your trust in Almighty God. Verse 20. We get verse 19. Yeah, verse 20. And Miriam the prophetess. Well, what does that mean? That means she teaches the truth of God's word. That's a woman. I hope you don't have a problem with that because God doesn't. He ordained Miriam a prophetess. The sister of Aaron took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Because God brought them out of Egypt. Verse 21. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. 
So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. You know, Jesus Christ is the living water that you will, if you partake of that, you will never thirst again, as is written in the Gospel of John. Verse 23, And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And whenever I hear bitter, I think about wormwood of Revelation chapter 11. That star that falls, that is called wormwood. Satan, when he arrives as the false Christ... And many people misunderstand. It says a third of the people are going to be killed. It doesn't mean literally. It means they're going to be spiritually deceived. They're going to become spiritually dead from worshiping the false Messiah. And it's only a third to remind you about Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. But you know that from Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, the entire world except for God's elect will be deceived and will worship the false Messiah. But they, they only went without for three days. And I, I want to read verse 24 first before I say what I was about to say. Verse 24. And the people murmured against Moses saying, What shall we drink? Just already complaining. After God parted the Red Sea, brought him through on dry land, completely protected him or them, destroyed their enemies, and now they're going to go start complaining. They only didn't have water for three days. Our Savior Jesus Christ, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in Matthew chapter 4. So his flesh was very weak at that point. And then Satan came and tried to tempt him and he still couldn't. And Jesus Christ taught us exactly how to overcome temptation in that chapter. Teaches us how Satan will offer you anything. All you got to do is worship him. That's what it's going to be when he arrives as the false Christ. Do not be deceived. He'll quote scripture just like he did in Matthew chapter 4. Do not be deceived by it. And don't complain. God provides everything that we need. There's going to be some hard times like, yeah, the water they had to drink wasn't that tasty. Who cares? But remember, those final five months, it's going to be rough. But you know God is going to completely protect you. He will provide for you as long as you do everything that you can do. Verse 25. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters... The waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them. This statue and ordinance that he made is to show you that God will always take care of you no matter what. If you're serving him, that tree, that tree is of course symbolic of the tree of life, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are two trees. The tree of life, which is Jesus Christ, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is the devil himself. Which you can read about in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 and Ezekiel chapter 31. But Jesus Christ, you, you let him come into your life in any situation, he's going to pull you right through it. But like I said, he, the God proved them. That means he tested him, them. God wants to know, do you truly love him or just only when everything's just going absolutely perfect? And don't ever forget 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 and 13. Which says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. It's an honor to suffer for Christ's sake. Remember in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, where, where the, some of the disciples, they, they had just been beating, they, they were getting beaten for serving Jesus Christ. And it says they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name's sake. Don't ever forget that. And you know your reward is great in heaven if you suffer for Christ's sake, if you're mocked for His sake. Like you read in Luke chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. But yeah, God's going to test you out. You truly love Him or not, He'll find out. And of course, I know you do if you take time to study His Word as much as you do. Verse 26. And said, don't ever, ever in your whole life forget this verse. Verse 26. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God... And will do that which is right in his sight, 
and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, did it say you don't have to worry about the diseases if you just go to church every week? No, you, I'm going to read again. You have to diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord God. You have to do what is right in his sight. You have to give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. You got to study the word. If you don't know what the Bible says, you don't know if you're keeping it or not. So no, just playing church, going to church every week, doing a lot of stuff that seems religious, that doesn't get it done. That doesn't protect you from the disease of the Egyptians. But if you are truly studying the Bible, truly trying to serve God, truly trying to do what's right, you don't have to worry one bit about those diseases. God protects. Now, and like it says in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28 gives you God's blessings if you do what's right. And it gives you his curses if you do what's wrong. And you can get a second witness to this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 27, and Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 60. Now, I said at the beginning, we're going to go to the book of Amos and the Minor Prophets. Let's go to complete this study. We're going to go Amos chapter 4. Once again, like I said at the beginning, this is something that everybody needs to read. This is something that everyone needs to understand. You're not going to get the book of Amos taught in most churches because most churches don't actually teach the Bible. They play church. They do a whole lot of stuff. They do basically everything but teach the Word of God. So Amos chapter 4, we're going to pick it up, verse 4. Amos chapter 4, verse 4, and it reads, Come to Bethel. You know what Bethel is it to be in translated? Beth is house, El is God. So this saying, come to the house of God. You're going to see that God is speaking in irony. He's basically being sarcastic in this verse. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. And bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. That tithes after three years, that's referring to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 and 29. But what's God saying here? He's saying, yeah, go ahead and come to church. Do all the religious stuff you want to do. But the point is, if you're not doing things God's way, then it's pointless. It's meaningless. Like you learn in the book, uh, in other places in the Minor Prophets, I think it goes into it in Hosea. It says that they call it Bethel, but it's actually Bethavin, which means it's a house of nothing. So once again, yeah, just going to church every week, that doesn't get it done. What goes on in your church? Do they teach the Bible or do they do a whole lot of other stuff, but you don't ever get a pastor up there teaching the Word of God straight out of the Bible in 99% of churches? So what happens there? It doesn't do you any good if you're not learning. When you leave church, ask yourself, what did I learn from the Bible today? Most people, they couldn't say a single thing because they just get the same thing over and over and over. A bunch of traditions, a bunch of, it's like a concert in most churches. But what did you learn there? Verse 5, God's still speaking in irony. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Remember, you know, we just learned in Exodus, you keep the leaven, you keep the false doctrine out. You keep the sin out. Saying, yeah, go ahead, offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. And proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O children of Israel, saith the Lord God. Like it would say in some place in Timothy, I can't remember where, it says, They are ever learning. They go to church all the time. But never come to the knowledge of the truth because the word is not taught there. God's saying, go ahead and do all that junk that you call religion. It's not going to do you any good. Verse 6. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth. That might sound good, but that's not, that means you don't have anything to eat. So you're not eating. You don't have anything to pick out of your teeth because you're starved. Because you don't have God's blessings. I've given you cleanliness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God tries to get their attention, but they just don't listen. What is the famine for? Amos chapter 8, verse 11. God says, a famine's coming that's not for bread nor for thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. God let us know that most churches aren't going to teach the word of God, but people still go Sunday after Sunday, completely wasting their time if the word of God is not taught there. Verse 7, 
And also I have withholding the rain from you. You're not going to get God's blessings. You're not going to get his wisdom. You're not going to get the understanding of prophecy. When there was yet three months to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and one piece was rained upon, and the piece were upon it rained not withered. If you don't have God's blessings, you are going to wither. You're going to ultimately be deceived. Once again, what, you could be right next to someone who's God's wrath coming down on, and you could be getting his blessings. Study the word of God. What happens in your church? Is the Bible taught there or a bunch of other stuff? Verse 8. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. You cannot help but think of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 5. Five of them didn't have enough oil because they played games instead of studying the word of God. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God keeps trying to get their attention. But if they won't, they, most people, they just don't listen because they were really because they were never even taught the Bible in the first place. But they should have known they should have had the natural. They should have been able to realize that if the Bible's not being taught, well, why do I want to go here? Verse nine, I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. Blasting is blight. That's the disease of a plant. But check out that word mildew. Check it out in your strong concordance. It's paleness. Have you ever read Revelation chapter 6, verse 8? The fourth seal, the pale horse. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. The palmer worm, you know from Joel chapter 1, that's the first stage of the locust army. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. They still won't listen. Verse 10. I have sent among you the pestilence after the man of Egypt. You know what pestilence is? That's epidemic disease. God said it would happen. But if you diligently hearken to him, you study his word and you follow his word, like we read in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, that disease doesn't come near you. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and I have made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. People still don't get it. Verse 11. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you're as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. He's saying, I still saved some of you. Well, what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Genesis chapter, what is it, 19? Homosexuality ran wild. Perversion. And God destroyed it. What do we see today? People say that same-sex marriage is right. They say that transgenderism is right. They have turned, they say what's wrong is right and what's right is wrong. God said it would happen. But God tells us exactly what the future holds in these minor prophets. This was written over 2,000 years ago. And he's telling us exactly what we're seeing before our very eyes today. Don't listen to what's politically correct. You listen to what God says is correct. And you know what's right from wrong. You know perversion is wrong. Once again, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I think it says this five times in these. Verse 12. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. If you still can't get it, you still don't realize you need to study the word, God's wrath is going to come down. And once again, they are going to be deceived by the false Christ. Verse 13 to complete. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought. God knows every thought that we have. You can't trick him. That maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. You know that the Lord, all caps there, is Yahweh. And remember Amos chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Surely God will do nothing except He first reveal it to His servants, the prophets. Well, who are the prophets? We just read it in God's Word. The Word of God tells us everything we need for today, for tomorrow. Like Christ would say in Mark chapter 13, verse 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Most people won't read it, though. Because they go to those churches like God was saying. He's saying, you're doing all these sacrifices, doing all this stuff that's religious, but it's worthless. 
Because you're not studying the Word of God there. You're not finding out what God wants. You're not reading the prophecies that God told us exactly what would happen thousands of years ago. And He would teach you how to be protected against it. But many people, they, they won't read. They won't study. They're going to be deceived. Don't let it happen to you. You stay in the Word, not taking my Word or anybody else's Word for what they say, but you study it for yourself. Anything someone says... Show me where that's at in the Bible. Uh, most people say, oh, well, I can't. Well, then don't listen to it. Don't believe it. Make them show you exactly where it's written or at least have tell you the verse so you can look at it yourself. Don't put your trust in any man. We just talked about last night in the questions and answers. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Curse be the man that puts his trust in man and make it flesh his arm. That's why so many people will be deceived. They think they can take preacher's word for it. They think they don't have to study for themselves. That's a tragedy. Don't, God warned them. Like I said, I think it was five times He warned them. They still refused to listen. You take heed to the warning that God gives, and He tells us everything that's going to happen in the future, so you will make that stand against the false Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, as is your destiny, as is written in Mark 13. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the prophecies you give us, for the warnings, for letting us know we just need to stick to your word. We thank you for your blessings in this place you've given us. We can share your word. And we just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.